Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. I would like to welcome all of you to Betsy Worship Service, the one o'clock Sunday service. This this Sunday is a milestone for us, well and truly, because on Tuesday there will be <clears throat> we will have completed nine years in ministry here at Betsy, and starting in our tenth. We've enjoyed every bit of it. <clears throat> We've met some really good people, and. We've just been blessed by this ministry, but uh, <clears throat> we pray that everyone here has a safe holiday tomorrow. Now the message today is about Peter, he is Aeneas, and Dorcas, and these are the lead us into uh, Cornelius next, next Sunday. But before we get started, let's go ahead and go to the Lord with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we were able to come out here again and, and bring your word. Lord God, we thank you for Miss Terry, for faithfully serving with me in this ministry for, for nine years already, starting our 10th year on, on Wednesday. Lord God, we've got so many other things that are more important than that. We have the people down in Florida who've been hit by two hurricanes back to back just a couple of weeks and the last I heard they were still trying to get the floodwaters to recede out of, out of town so they could assess the damage and start rebuilding again. The people up in up in the corner of Asheville, Tennessee, Georgia and North Carolina and South Carolina. Lord God, those people are has some horrible stuff happen to them. So we pray for your hand to come in and help them. We know that you have Samaritan's purses, you know, both of these, all these places. You know, Operation Blessings at all these places. Lord, we give them over to you to keep them safe and to help them be fruitful in all the things they do for the kingdom. Lord, we pray for the students here at Fancy, Lord. There, uh, we just pray they do well in their studies, that everything works out for them here. Lord God, any of them that ever, ever need anything, it's always, I'm always available to talk to them and Miss Terry to the ladies. But either way, Lord, we give these, give these students over to you for your hand of protection and provision. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, as I said, the title of the message is Peter heals Aeneas and Dorcas. Well, starting at verse 32, we see a change of focus. Focus from the converted Saul to the ministry of Peter on his travels. Now, he would be involved with the work of a missionary, but his ability to heal in the name of Jesus would stand out. The ability to heal was used by Jesus to cause people to believe in and be drawn to him, the God-man. Now, forgiving sin and healing the sick was definitely an attention getter because it paved the way to the cross. It paved the way for Jesus to go to the cross because of all the things he did in, in the Father's name and in his own authority, that just made the religious authorities in, um, in Jerusalem want to get him that, that much more. So everything he did to prove that he was he was God, that he was the God man, healing people, raising people from the dead, all these things was just his his footsteps to the cross. But the gift of healing through the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Christ was always a way to draw people. Draw people to Christ, the risen Savior, who paid the ultimate price that you or I could ever repay. But as we go through chapter 9, we'll see that every healing brought more to Christ. And what I'm saying is, Peter or the other apostles or Jesus himself healed one person, but healing, healing one person, raising one person from the dead, that brought more multitudes of people to the faith because they believed. They saw what happened and they believed in the miracles. They believed in the ones who brought the miracles. Because Peter or the other apostles has ever been documented to taking credit for any healing or, or raising anybody from the dead. 
anybody who was healed or raised from the dead, it was always in the name of Jesus. It, and that was that was part of the problem for Peter and John when they got arrested, was they were healing people in the name of Jesus, and they were told not to do that also. But we'll, that's a different story, and we'll get to that later. But this is what Acts 9, 32 and 33 says. Now it came to pass as Peter went through all parts of the country, that he also came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. There he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been in bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. Now here we have a, the visit Peter made to the churches that were newly planted by the dispersed preachers. Now he passed through all quarters. As an apostle, he was not to be a resident pastor of any one church, but an itinerant visitor or preacher in all of the churches. But that's what, what Paul, how Paul the apostle was called to. He was called to plant and strengthen and lift up, exhort the, the church plants. But he wasn't ever called to be the pastor of the church. But as an apostle, as I said, he was not to be the pastor of any one church. His purpose at, the, at these churches was to confirm the doctrine of inferior preachers. That sounds kind of derogatory when you read it, now, and I kept reading it as a note. But what it's talking about is inferior. He's not saying that they were bad. What he was saying was, in their knowledge of doctrine, their knowledge was inferior, not the, not the preachers themselves. So that's what he came for. That's what Paul, Paul's epistles were about, is ensuring that the, the pastors, the preachers, have the right doctrine. This purpose of these churches, as I said, is to confirm the doctrine of inferior preachers to confer the Holy Spirit on those who believed and to ordain ministers. He was, like his master, the Lord Jesus Christ, always on the move. And he went about doing good, but it's still his headquarters were in Jerusalem. For there, there we shall find him in prison in Acts 12, 4. So when he had been arrested, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, keep him, intending to bring him before the people after the Passover. Now what the story behind this verse is, is Peter and James were coming, coming out of the temple, and Herod, with his entourage there, he put James to the sword right there. And he saw that it pleased the people. That's why he arrested Peter, and he put Peter in prison. Peter was chained up, and he had rotating uh, four guards on him to keep, keep, him, keep him in custody until Herod was ready to put him to death. Well, an angel came, and an earthquake freed them, or actually did. The earthquake didn't come at this one. This is a different one with the earthquake. But the, the angel came and released Paul, uh, Peter, opened the door and let him out. And he thought he was in a dream until he got outside and realized that he, he wasn't dreaming, that he was free. So he went back to where the disciples were. And they thought he was a, was a ghost or, or his angel or something because they wouldn't let him in to start with. But anyway, that, that's another story, but that's what the background of this one verse is. But this is when Herod, as I said, killed James with the sword and imprisoned Peter plain to execute him later. It would be after the festival of unleavened bread, but Peter was rescued by the angel first. Now, we come to Aeneas and his condition, but his intent was to come to visit the saints in Lydda, the Christians, are called saints, not only some particular eminent ones, such as St. Peter and St. Paul, but every sincere professor of the faith of Christ. These are the saints of the earth. This is what it says in Psalm 16, 3. As for the saints who are on the earth, 
They are the excellent ones in whom all is all my delight. Sainthood is conveyed, conveyed on the believer because of their professed faith in the finished work of Christ and his cross. Now Acts 9, 34 and 35 says, And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Rise and make, make your bed. Then he arose immediately. So all who dwelt in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. So that's what I'm saying. One healing would draw people to, the, to Jesus. One healing would draw people to the apostles in the name of Jesus. So people were going to be saved by this one man being healed of his, his paralysis. He, he was healed, but people would see and believe and they would come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which was the whole point. Now it says, Jesus Christ heals you. Everyone who witnessed the healing believed. The outcome of the one physical healing was many spiritual healings. And I know that uh, Jesus did, he didn't do the, the amount of healings and raising from the dead. Miracles as he, he had the power to do. He could have healed everybody. When he called Lazarus out of the tomb, he called him by name because if he had to call him by name, every every grave in the world would have been empty. And one day it will be that way. When he calls us all home and the dead in Christ rise. But the point was not physical healing. The point was spiritual healing. People coming to faith in Jesus Christ and being saved. But it did, but, and this is the point of the healings, but when the church had grown significantly, uh, the focus changed. As you go through the book of Acts, you get to, you see that people are being healed and you see miraculous things happen. But as you get towards the latter of chapters of, of uh, Acts, you start seeing that the focus changes from healings and resurrection and raising people from the dead to preaching the gospel. And that was because the church had significantly grown, but they were, were fairly secure. Even though they were under persecution, they were fairly secure. And they didn't need to do anything but share the gospel with people to bring them to Christ. They didn't have to have an attention to them. Then he turned to the Lord Jesus because they saw more than a crippled man walking around. They saw proof that Jesus was alive from the dead and had authority over disease. And that was the whole point of healing and raising the dead, bringing people in faith to Christ. Peter healed a crippled man, but shortly because of that act, he will restore the, to life the woman named Dorcas. Now Acts 9, 36 and 37 say, at Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works, charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had rushed her, they laid her in an upper room. A point of interest about the name of Tabitha, translated Dorcas, is that they both meet. <coughs> Excuse me. And they both mean gazelle. In Aramaic, Tabitha is translated gazelle. And Dorcas in Greek is also translated as gazelle. There are many places in Scripture where Scripture shows a name as translated or something else. And we say, why? But the only reason I have is the language is used was Aramaic, and the language of the New Testament is Greek. Now Acts 9.38 says, And since Lydda was near Joppa, and disciples had heard that Peter was there, they went, sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to, coming to them. Peter healing Aeneas in the name of Jesus got the message moving out. And that was the point. Here we have another Another miracle wrought by Peter for the confirming of the gospel. 
which exceeded the former, the raising of Tabitha delightful when, when she had been for some time dead. Now here, here is the life and death and character of Tabitha on whom this miracle was wrought. She lived at Joppa, a seaport town in the tribe of Dan, where Jonah took a trip and took a ship to go to Tarshish. Now I call Joppa, Joppa. Her name was Tabitha, a Hebrew name, the Greek for, for, for which is Dorcas, both signifying a doe, or a hind, or a deer, or a pleasant creature. And Dorcas was, by all accounts, a pleasant creature. She was a disciple, one that had embraced the faith of Christ and was baptized. And not only that, but was eminent above many for her works of charity. She showed her faith by her works, and her work, her good works, which she was full of, which is, and that is, in which she she abounded. Her head was full of cares and contrivances which she should do good. You don't see a lot of people that are always engaged in their mind, in their heart, setting up good things they can do for other people. But that's what Dorcas was consumed with, was doing good for others. She was she was filled with that, that mindset and heart set to do good to others. She was a, a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, and she was made for good works like all of us were after we come to faith, because the works we do before Christ are as filthy rags. But our, our works after we're saved, that's what we were saved for, is to do good works. Sadly, many people get get saved or believers saved and never do a good work for any reason. But she devised things as we see in Isaiah 32, 8 says, but a generous man devises generous thing and by generosity he shall stand. So what is what Isaiah 32, 8 is saying is that the generous or looking and searching out more things to be generous with and generous to and, and to generous with other people. But that is the way we should all be looking to do good in the kingdom. Now his hands were full of good employment. Or her hands, excuse me. Her hands were full of, of good employment. She made a business of doing good and was never idle. Having learned to maintain good works as in Titus 3.8. This is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Now that's what it's saying is we, and all through these scriptures about Dorcas, Tabitha, Gazelle, is that we should be striving to do good in the name of Christ, because of Christ. And you know, I prayed earlier about the people working in North Carolina and Tennessee and all around for, for Hurricane Helene and the ones in Florida working. These charitable organizations, Samaritan's Purse and um, Operation Blessing, they're doing this in the name of Jesus. They're, as they do good things for people to help restore them, they're also preaching the gospel to them. They're sharing the gospel with them at least. And many are coming being and saved. And there's nothing that bad that ever happens that God cannot use it to help increase his kingdom. And that's, that's the important thing to look at when we see this. How is God going to use this, this tragedy? How is he going to turn it around? How, how is somebody going to be saved because of this tragedy? But it's so important to remember we are saved for good works. 
but not by any, any works done before we come to faith in Christ, which saves no one. And when I say that, a lot of people, when you share, try to share the gospel with them, they say, I'm a good person. I, I do charitable things for people. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, all the good works you do in the world won't help you escape separation from God and hell in the end. So we need to not fixate on the works that we do before salvation. We need to fixate on the sin we did before salvation and pray to God to be redeemed and cleansed by Jesus Christ's shed blood. Acts 9, 39 and 41 says, And Peter rose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all out, knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. She opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave, gave her, her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. Now, I always, I always think people like Lazarus, people like Dorcas, that scripture says she was a believer. She was a follower of Christ. She did, she did many good works. When she died, there was a, that broke the hearts of people, and they wanted her restored to life. But it doesn't say that Dorcas was jumping up, kicking up her heels, and she was alive again, and she was called out of heaven. So uh, all right, that's just food for thought. You know, if you go to if you die and you go to heaven, do you want to come back, or would you rather stay where you were? The success builds upon success, and the more Peter did for the kingdom, the more he was sought out. We will see in our next message the story of Cornelius and his household. We're going to, we're coming to an important transition from a strictly Jewish church, transforming to a mix of Jew and Gentile church, one in Messiah Jesus. Jesus is the uniting person of the faith because your salvation is contingent on what you do with Jesus. Do you only have a head knowledge, a passing knowledge, or do you have a heart knowledge of the one who saved you? Tabitha was raised from death to life, not because of who she was, but because of who Jesus is. Peter and the rest of the apostles were sure to always give credit to the name of Jesus, no matter what. That is the model for all believers not to assume credit for anything done in the power of the Holy Spirit. When we say we're soul winners, really what we're saying is we take a lost person and we point to the one who can save them because I can't win anybody's soul. All I can tell about is the one who can, the one who went to the cross, the one who died, the one who gave his life a ransom for everybody. Sadly, Everybody will never believe because people are so intent on living their lives by their own rules that they think that doing anything in relation to Jesus Christ is, is limited to them. I tell you the truth, there's no limit to the factor. If you follow Jesus Christ, you're as free as you'll ever be in your entire life. Nothing ever, you ever do before will make you as free as being in Jesus Christ. And Peter, Paul, and all the other apostles, when they were in prison, in jail, in chains, and socks, they were still free, more free than the ones who were guarding them because they were saved. They knew Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's what saves us. That's what frees us up. That's what our freedom comes from. Finally, verse 9, 42 and 43 says, they became known throughout all of Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon of Tana. Now, verse 42 and 43 kind of leave us, leave us off from Tabitha and Aeneas. 
I'll do a transition verses because in chapter 10 we're going to look at Cornelius. We're going to look at Peter being on top of the house and the Lord let down the sheep with, with unclean animals on it, telling Peter to, to kill and eat. And we'll, we'll, we'll explore that next week because that's an important, important place because that's where the Gentiles start coming into the church. But verse 43 is a key verse too. It says, So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon the Tanner. We, we've talked about in the prodigal son, the, the Jewish son was working in a pig pen. Not a good thing for, 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 for a Hebrew. Then we look at other things, but a, a tanner, a tanner of hides, was not, it may be a good job, it may be a good way to make money, but it wasn't the cleanest business to be in. And to stay at a tanner's house, that would automatically make you unclean. Then, you know, also look at shepherds. They weren't, the, they weren't respected for the job they did they were thought of as less than because they were unclean because of the job they had. So, what I'm saying is, it's really a big deal that Simon's staying with, or uh, Peter is staying with Simon of Tanner. And we're gonna see some more about it. It's gonna make a, make a big difference in the, the gospel. But Peter's going from success to success, and as long as he remembers who, who it is who heals, he will be fine. After Christ was rest, uh, rest, resurrected and sent back to his rightful place in heaven, now the Holy Spirit came to and dwelled a believer, but a terrified apostle. Remember, the, the 120 disciples were in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. They had been there since Jesus had left 10 days prior and sent him back to heaven. They were waiting on the other shoe to fall on them. And they, they were praying. They weren't praying to Lord, give us somebody to preach the gospel to. Just let us make it through another day without being taken prisoner and thrown in jail and executed. But when the Holy Spirit came upon them, that hung between the upper room, they went from being a bunch of chickens, scared chickens, to being bold, bold eagles. They would go out and share the gospel with whoever, regardless of what the consequences were. The consequences of your sin are one thing, but the consequences of your testimony is much better to be, be endured because your testimony for Christ may cause you some short-term problems here, but they will lead to your glory in heaven. Now, verse 43, as I said, is a transition scripture for next week's message, and it sets up the meeting with Cornelius. Peter staying with the tanner, as I said, was a town of animal skins. It was a really big deal, and we'll see that next time. But just remember, shepherds and those who, who were in the tanning business were ceremonially unclean. They were unclean for the purpose of the temple or synagogue worship, so we can see the conflict coming there. Prayer slide. Never doubt what one prayer can do. Skip through to the last slide. Prayer is the cure for a confused mind, a weary soul, and a broken heart. And I, I can testify to that. Sometimes you, you just your mind gets so busy with with life and doing even doing ministry. Yeah, if you just take an extra few minutes to sit down and talk to God about it, the confusion will just just evaporate. But that's that's the that's what we're, we're, we're to do. We're called to pray to God in the name of Jesus and the Spirit, so that we can find peace peace with God.
Well, we're going to close in prayer and wish everybody a happy Columbus Day tomorrow. Father God, we thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your provisions. We thank you for this ministry. Lord, we know it's a tough ministry. But Lord God, we, we, we relish in it every day. But Lord God, we, we've had nine, nine fruitful years here. And many things have transpired through this little ministry. But Lord God, we just ask, ask an abundance of people to come. Hear your word. Your mystery leads to music. All these things are so important to the, to the kingdom. But we have so many people who just give you no, no credit, no time at all. And Lord, we pray for all the students here at Plessy. We, we can pray for the ones who don't come. We can pray for them to fail and do, do bad in their studies because they didn't give you time. But that, that wouldn't be Christian to do. And that's why we, we always pray for the ones who come and the ones who don't come. We pray for them to be lifted up. And Lord, we lift it up in your name. Lord God, we give you praise and glory for all the things you do. And we know that all the things work together for good to those who love you. And then your precious son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.